Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It's, it's been a wonderful time in the presence of God. And I love what the Lord has been doing uh, this morning. And the focus of the singing and the adoration to God has been surrender. We surrender everything to God. And we continue in that, uh, in that vein. We continue in that spirit of saying to God, we surrender everything. Praise God. Hallelujah. Imagine if a man came into this church, or a woman, a servant of God, and uh, came and stood here on the, on, on, the, on the pulpit and began to speak. And as he opens his sermon, he opens with his credentials. And he tells you that I'm visiting you from such and such church or such and such ministry. And the Lord has blessed me and he has uh, used me. And people have experienced a great move of God through me. And he continues to say that I speak in tongues. Every day, I am very proficient. I, the enemy knows that I speak in tongues. I speak in tongues with power. And he says not only that, God has also blessed me and given me the gift of I speak in tongues of all tongues of men. I don't need an interpreter. Last year, I went to China and I spoke in Mandarin and and the Chinese, they, they were so blessed and they came to the Lord. And on my way back, I stopped over in India. And I spoke in their different languages and I went over to Pakistan and I spoke in Urdu. This is how God is using me. And then he says that I'm also moved, I move in the prophetic. I see many things that many people do not see. The Lord speaks to me and he shares with me his secrets. And he turns around and says to you, sister there, the Lord is saying, and he begins to prophesy to you. And he says that I will prophesy as I speak. Just hold on to your seats. He says that I understand all of God's secret plans. He says that the Lord has blessed me with all knowledge. There is nothing that I don't know. I have been to Harvard, I've been to Oxford, and I've spoken to the students and they were amazed at the knowledge that I have. Praise God. He says that I have faith that moves mountains. What I did last week is somebody came into one of my meetings when I was in China speaking Mandarin in a wheelchair. And they told me that they had been in a wheelchair since they were born. And I looked at them and I said, legs straighten up and they jumped up hallelujah and he says to you that on the way here the lord touched me and i sold everything i have five houses and i put them all on the market and i gave all the money to the poor this would be a great man isn't he is this not a great man well you would say amen if i was that man your amen in this room would ring, I'm telling you. Some people would be moving closer to the front. When he finishes his preaching and he does an altar call, Brother Clement, there will be a stampede in this place. We won't be able to stop people coming here because the great man of God is, may just lay hands on you and you may just have your financial breakthrough. Your marriage may just, <laughs> just blossom again. That migraine that you've been suffering with, it may just disappear. I am telling you, when he does an altar call, it won't be one of those of waiting for five minutes. You will be here. Most of people will be here. Man of God, touch me. Touch my head. Lay hands on me. You know what the Bible says? If this man that has done all these things that has just been moved with the greatest of, of, of miracles, who knows everything, who knows the secrets of God, that if he does not have love, 
He is nothing. He is absolutely nothing if he does not have love. It is not about how much he came here and he impressed with his testimony and how much he is able to move in the gifts and how much he is able to prophesy and how God has given him the gift of all languages. We assign value to people by some of the things that we see. We assign value to the servants of God by the works that we see, by their CV, by how big their church is, by how many crusades and conferences they are invited to speak at. Sometimes we assign value to the servants of God by how eloquent and how they speak and how they move and their voice can move you. They are great orators. They don't stand before you and say, um, 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 um. They speak and you feel like someone is speaking. And you begin to say, why can't our pastor speak like this one? They have great following on YouTube and Instagram and social media. And so we have assigned value to them. But the Bible completely devalues everything that they do if they don't have love. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 1 and 3 says, If I could speak all languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Parents of young children would understand what this means. When your child decides he has found a drum in the living room and begins to bang it until you just say, child, stop, give me, give, give me, give me peace. That is how Paul is describing such a person. I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans, not only some of them, but I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. The Lord has been speaking to me, and this may be a little repetition from those who were in the Bible study a few weeks ago, the Bible study on fellowship on Koinonia, and I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters from Fountain Church, please avail yourself to the Bible study. My prayer is that every single one of you when you are able to, you log on to Zoom and you will sit there with others for an hour and a half, two hours and hear the word of God. It is so important. And so we were sharing about koinonia, about fellowship. And we realized that the central message of Christianity, the central message of Jesus Christ is love. Without love, everything that we do is useless. Without love, everything we do is futile. It is just noise. The Bible says that God loved the world. And because of the love that he had for his people, for the world, he sent, he gave a gift. And that gift is of himself. He sent his only son, God himself, came in the form of Jesus Christ. And what caused him to do this and to sacrifice his life and himself and die a painful death is because of love. If it wasn't for love, we would have no redemption. We would have no salvation. We would have no hope of a better life. No hope of eternity away from the suffering and the pain of the world. We would have no hope in the inheritance that we've been promised as co-heirs with Christ. This has been made possible not because we were good, not because we deserved it, 
but because he loved. And this is why Paul is saying that if I do all these things and I don't have love, it is nothing. May the Lord teach us what love does to our actions. What love does to everything that we do. In the late 90s, my family and I came to the UK. And we came here as refugees. When you come into a new country as a refugee, life is very interesting. It's a very humbling situation to be in. It is a very... Uh, it's a situation where you, you, you feel degraded. You are almost subhuman. And I thought that this would change over time. But the way that I see some parts of our society speak about refugees, sometimes when I turn on the, the news and the way I, I hear the media and commentators and politicians speak about refugees, you may not relate, but I relate very much to it because I understand what it's like to be a refugee. Nobody needs to tell you that you are not welcome because you already feel out of place. You don't need any politician to use you as a political football. You already know that you are an outcast. You already know that you are where you are, not because you are invited to come, but because you managed to make your way there out of desperation. So I found myself here with my siblings we are in London. We'd been here before as tourists. Now you come as a refugee. It's a completely different London. You are like a rabbit in headlights. You don't know what is going on. And you have people doing things for you. Even back in those days, there were charities that were uh, working and helping refugees. But I tell you, there is one or two people that we met. And these people, we straight away connected because we could see that they loved us. And that love was so moving, my brethren. When you come into a place and you find someone or a family that has need for nothing, but they decide to sacrifice their possessions and their time, and they help you and they welcome you and they make you feel like you are a human being. It is such a blessing. You know who I'm talking about. Love is the greatest, most powerful, most eloquent, loudest language that can be spoken by a human being and was first spoken by the Almighty God. As a young boy, being a refugee was a time where I needed to find myself. And I struggled with a lot of things because people say things that they don't realize how harmful they are. Sometimes they say them in jest, sometimes it is in ignorance. But you start finding yourself denying who you are. You begin to lie where you come from. You begin to walk with a chip on your shoulder. You, you, don't, you, you, you are always conscious that I am other. I am different. I'm a refugee. But I connected with this family and, 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 and you know, one day I pray that, you know, Pat and Alan and, 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 and Bradley and Catherine, that they come here and I, sh I, I tell you these are the people that I'm talking about. Because we are in this home and this man comes and he spends weeks doing up the council home that we've been given. Speaking to me and my, and my family like we, are, like we are people. It is not just a service he's providing. We are people. We are worth something. We have value. And this is why he is spending all his time taking time of work to come and to be with us. And this was the mitigating factor in my life 
that mitigated against me feeling worthless and being taken by another route of some children who feel worthless. You see them. You will see them on TV. You will see them on the streets. You will see them in prison. It protected me from finding identity in other things and other people and groups that were not good for me because somebody showed me love and that love spoke value. You are important enough for me to put my hands in my pocket and pay for something. You are important enough for me to come off work, for me to take annual leave. I'm telling you these people I'm speaking of, they were well of middle class. They could take their holidays and go to Jamaica. They could go to St. Lucia. But I know that they forwent some holidays. Because they spent their resources. No one was paying them. They were not part of a charity. But they spent their resources to make sure that we have a home that is worth living. Love spoke a message that touched me so much that almost 30 years later, I'm speaking of these people. They introduced us to the church. They would pick us up and do multiple rounds. They helped us, my parents, to get a car. They were Christians, but the love that they spoke of in their, in, 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 in their actions spoke louder than the encouragement that came from their mouth and the scriptures that they spoke to us. In these last days, God is asking for you to surrender yourself to him and to be used as an agent of love. So it's wonderful that we have sung, I surrender, I want to know you more. It was easy to sing that because there was such a beautiful presence in this place. And the music was, you know, I was privileged to jump in on the bass and, and I just love being able to be part of the team that leads you. But if it is just, if it ends there, if it ends on, in, in good music and good sound and, and a beautiful atmosphere and then we don't go and do the actual thing, you see, when you surrender, <laughs> the reason why we're refugees is because my, the government that I lived under surrendered. Or they were forced to come out of power. We are seeing a war in, in Ukraine, and the purpose is they have wanted the government there to surrender. When you actually come to the time of surrender after you fought and you've been defeated, you then don't demand what to do. When you surrender, you are at the mercy of your captors. So when you sing a song to God, say, I surrender, it means that I am bringing myself to your mercy. You haven't forced me. I am doing it willingly. But because I said I'm surrender, it means that I can't then dictate what you want me to do. And so when you're singing, I surrender, God responds and says, right, I want you to begin living a life of sacrificial love. And let us look at what that looks like. In these last days, in this revival, the revival of the age, God is speaking to his church and to his people and saying to them that love is central to everything. If you don't have love, you might as well stop. Quit. Because you are playing religion. And the people of the world are sick and tired of religion. When you go out on the streets to evangelize for Striva, this is the theme that comes out over and over again. People that say that the church just doesn't seem to love us. That is what I get from their stories. 
We meet many young men and women who used to go to church and they left the church. And let me tell you something, love draws, love doesn't repel. And so when we have young people walking away from faith, when we have people walking away from churches, we must know that it is because the people that God has called his own, when he says that I am looking for laborers, but there are few, the few of us that are here, it means that the way that we are doing things is mechanical and religious, but is lacking in love. Because when we are filled with the Spirit of God and begin to operate in love, that becomes a catalyst for revival. Let me show you what happened. This is the first church. They followed what the Bible spoke about in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. It says, a new commandment I give you. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. Because they had commandments. They had the 10 and they had the Levitical commandments and they did not understand the spirit of these commandments. When God said to them in the 10 commandments, thou shalt love your, the Lord your God that you will not have idols. He was saying to them, I want you to be completely dedicated to me and emulate my character. But they missed it. They completely missed it. Huh. And so Jesus said to them, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He says, this all, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And the disciples took this on and they embraced this. And through embracing this, when God poured out his spirit and revival came, they began to act according to this new commandment. And I'm saying to you, my brothers and my sisters, that this commandment is for you and I, a new commandment God has given us. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. This is what he's saying. He's saying that stop, look, think, analyze, contemplate how I have loved you. Think about how gracious and merciful I've been to you. Think about how caring I've been to you. He's asking you, do you think you deserved to be here right now? Do you think you deserve to be living in one of the richest places in the world? Many of you going to work with a job and a salary at the end of the month. And your salary, you know, it's coming. It's not like some other places where you, people actually pray that they will be paid. Where governments and civil service can turn around and say, we have no money. But keep working, we'll pay you. Where even if you're not working and you are being supported by the state where you know that the state will support you. Do you think you deserve this? Do you think you deserve to be alive? Do you think that as you drove to church this morning, you deserve to have driven and arrived here safely when there are others who have had accidents around the country? When you've been on the motorway and you've been driving at 70, no faster because you're all very good people. <laughs> Do you think you deserve to have averted all the tragedies? We just went through a pandemic where many people died. Do you think you deserve to have gone through all that and come out the other end? Do I think I deserve to have gone through a civil war where 8 million people plus died? Go through it. Where they were looking to kill us, go through barricades. You've had the testimony where we're in the forest 
and they have come to kill us and they've dug graves, open graves, and we are not even worth shooting. Imagine when you're not even worth shooting. They can't even be bothered to waste their bullets. They're just going to bury us alive. These are things I've lived, I've seen. Do I deserve? Why did all the other children? I saw so many corpses as I walked. As a child, I saw so many corpses. I, I know many people that died. And so what is it that they did? Or what is it that I did that has caused my God to sustain my life? What I'm talking about is my process of analysis. I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm analyzing. Because before I fulfill the commandment of, of Christ, where he said that I give you another commandment, that as I have loved you, you love one another. I'm not able to love you. I'm not able to love my wife. I'm not able to love Deborah. I'm not able to love uh, my brother, my sister, without understanding how he loved me. Otherwise, I will be loving wrong. If I don't look at the way God loved me and use that as my standard for love, I will be loving wrong. And the problem is the church is loving wrong. We are loving those that we want to love, those who agree, those who are well polished those are the ones we love if someone walks into this church and they are well put together they smell good they look good they talk good then we will be ready to embrace them and say I love you brother but if someone walks in here smelling of alcohol comes and vomits at the front because he's drunk too much and comes and says pray with me you will say in Jesus name hallelujah be blessed from over there because he doesn't fit the criteria of who you ought to love and now when it is time to invite somebody to your home you know who you're going to invite he says as I loved you then you will love one another and he's speaking to the believers right now. He's saying that, so that all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so when revival took place in the church, when the first church was established, it was established on a foundation of love. And they were able to have a great impact and change the lives of the world through the building of community, the community of believers. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. This all happened when the church was first established. Jesus has ascended. They've been waiting for him to fulfill the promise that he said, I will send you a helper. They are desperate for this helper because they've realized that without him, they are very weak. On Wednesday, we were learning about Peter. We were looking at the anatomy of backsliding. And we were looking at how Peter was very proud of himself. When Jesus told him that he would deny him, Peter said very emphatically, very, very loudly, I, I can just picture him, being cross and saying, absolutely not. I will never do that. But you just fast forward a little bit later, and Peter finds himself in a situation where he has, he's despaired and he says, I don't know him. Three times. And so Peter, who was, I believe, one of the most stronger characters, if he was able to be under pressure to deny Jesus, how about the others? They are all there, they are sitting there. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit of God, comes upon them. They are filled with the Holy Ghost. They begin to speak in tongues of men. In tongues of it. And, and Peter begins to preach. The man who was sitting with those girls, the servant girls of the priest denying Jesus, 
not once, not twice, but three times, stands up in front of thousands of people in Jerusalem and begins to proclaim and to speak the gospel of power. With the full knowledge that Rome is not going to be happy about this and, and Herod won't be happy about this. But the boldness that they received, he preaches and the church begins, but it begins on the foundation of love. Because even he himself, the preacher, had just received a great dose of mercy from his Lord Jesus Christ. Even when he denied him, Jesus still loved him. And so the Bible says that 3,000 people became born again on that one day. 3,000 people. Can you imagine if we went to preach in Ashford and 3,000 people became born again, the current churches that we have here would not have space for them. Yes, all the churches. 3,000 people became born again. And so the church began. And as the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, and these are some of these 3,000, and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer, a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place. I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. The believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Each day. Hallelujah. I want us to look at this scripture and just look at what they did because this was a time of revival. And I believe that we are at the cusp of revival. I believe that we are at a time of the end time revival where the Bible spoke, the prophecy said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. We are in those times where he's ready to pour out his spirit on us for us to begin to walk in the works of the spirit. But then he says that that must be nurtured and built on a foundation of love. If we want to see growth, if we want to see God moving in miraculous ways, if we want to see a change in our communities, in our families, on our streets, if we want to see a change in this country and on this continent, we must begin to walk and practice love. Our programs are not enough. It's wonderful what Olive is doing. It's wonderful what Restore is doing. It is wonderful what the intercessors are doing. It's wonderful that we've opened a cafe. But if this is not done on the foundation of love, we might as well pack our bags and go home. Because for there to be revival and for that to be nurtured, it must be nurtured on the foundation of love. Not of judgment. Not of self-serving. But of love. Why are we doing what we're doing? I know you love your church and we all say we want the church to grow. We do evangelism and we, say, we do some evangelism on social media. We want the fountain. Why do you want it? So that we can say we are a big church? Is it so that we can say that look at the works that we do? We are feeding the hungry. What is the motivation if it is not motivated by love by love for the fellow man love for the believer first I don't know if you missed it but they were being added to every day every single day they were being added to one day 3,000 and every day this church was receiving new people receiving new people what is it they are doing differently? Because we are preaching. We are on YouTube. We are on Instagram. We are doing all we can. Why are we not seeing numbers? People being saved every day. That should be our story fountain church. 
That should be our experience. Every day, we are having people come through those doors or through the doors of our homes saying, we want to know this Jesus that you serve. Because we have seen how much you love one another. And we are not experiencing love in our community, in our society. He says that they will know that you are my disciples because they will observe and they will see that you love one another. Do you know the politics that is in the church? Do you know the offense that is in the church, every church? When you look at many churches, it's become just a microcosm of the fallen world. People are ready to step on each other's toes to get their way. In the church, you are getting people who are doing things with ulterior motives. People who are not walking in understanding without trying to see what is it that makes my brother, my sister act the way they act. We are so self-serving in the church today. And that cannot be the formula for revival. Do you know we stand on the streets and we speak to people who say to them, I will never go into the church. Because what they saw in the church was nothing different from what they experienced outside. Some of these people, they've already been hurt by the world. They've already been through trauma. They are already victims of abuse. And they've come into the church and they become abused. They face the very same abuse from authority that they faced when they were in their homes. And they say, we thought we came to a sanctuary, to a place of refuge. We didn't realize we just came to a sanctimonious people who have put themselves on a pedestal but have nothing to offer. And God is saying, Fountain Church, let us be different. Let us look at what these people did. And let us look at what they did indeed. The Bible says, a deep sense of all came over them all. Do you know God is revealed when we come together in unity? There is a purification that happens. The Bible says that where there is unity, I command a blessing. God commands a blessing. When you are living in the blessing of God, there is the awe of God. Hallelujah. There is the fear of God, the holy fear of God. The KJV says fear, the King James Version. He says there was a sense of fear. In Greek, phobos. Phobos, where phobia comes from. Where you are something phobic. They were in such awe of God's grace and God's mercy and the righteousness of God that they had holy fear. This is what happens when you build a foundation of love and you come together. The Bible says that a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles were able to perform miracles and signs and wonders because they were in the midst of a church that was in awe of the Lord. And this awe was not only restricted to the church, even the people outside were in awe. I was looking at different writings of this time. There's an Ethiopian Bible. It's not part of the canon of Scripture. But it, it expands on this and it speaks about even animals were in awe, were, were, were in fear. Because of what was going on, there was a sense of awe. God and His presence was in Jerusalem. And in the neighboring cities and towns. Hallelujah. You know Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It is when we are in awe of God that we begin to understand what God wants us to do. It is the beginning of wisdom. And the awe comes when we are together on the foundation of love. They were together. And a sense of awe came over them. Do you know when you are outside of the fellowship, when you're one of those lone sheep who doesn't like to be around people, that is where the devil gets you to start to lose your awe for God. Because you have no accountability. 
You don't want someone to pull you up and say, brother, sister, what is going on? Instead of being offended when we are corrected, we should rejoice and embrace the fact that we are in a fellowship where somebody is able to correct us. Because they were together and they were able to correct one another, they were able to encourage one another, to spur one another on to greater works, the Bible says that a sense of awe came upon them. A sense of awe. You may lose your sense of awe when you refuse to be part of community. There are brethren in this church that have understood accountability. And they come to me and say, Pastor, I am accountable to you. And they've given me license and permission to speak into their lives, to rebuke, to encourage, to admonish. And I've watched them and say that you are seeking to be in awe of God. Because you have put value on fellowship and on the servants of God. Hallelujah. God is revealed when we come together in unity. And there is a purification. And there's a sense of awe. And then there is a call to forsake cliques. Do you know what a clique is? Hmm? You know what a clique is? The young people say gang. Gang, gang, gang. My gang. God doesn't want you to have a gang. A call to forsake cliques and open our arms to all believers so that no one is left behind. The Bible says, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. All the believers. Not some of the believers. Not the believers of the Hebrew origin. Not the Gentile believers. You realize that when 3,000 people came to Christ, what was happening in that time, uh, during the time of the Passover, there were so many visitors that had come in to Jerusalem. It was a great time of commerce. And so some of the people that came to Christ, that came to faith, were Jews. Others were Roman. Others were Greek. Others were from Mesopotamia. They were from all over the place, from the east, from the west. They had congregated in Jerusalem and they all came together and they all received Christ and the church was formed. And the Bible says that all these believers, not the white ones, not the brown ones, not the black ones, but all the believers came together in one place and shared everything they had. The church has become clicky. It's become clicky. People go to church to look for their people. And they say that I'm comfortable in this church because my peoples are in this church. God rebukes that spirit. When revival was taking place, it is all the believers that came together. It is not the ones that came from here or that shared this or that were in this economic group. It is all the believers you know, there's a story I read of a man in Canada who was working in one of these high-paced jobs and he's in an office and he passed away on a Monday in his office. He had a heart attack and he passed away with his hands on the desk with his computer in front of him in his chair. Do you know when they realized the man had died? When the cleaners came in on Saturday. And of course, when the doctors came and did what they did, that's when they investigated and realized the man had died on the Monday. This is the world we are living in today, where there is no love, where people are left to die by themselves, even in the church, especially in big growing churches, in a place where 3,000 people come to Christ. It is very possible that that one who does not have friends, who is a little bit of an outcast, can die spiritually because of cliques in the church. Now, if I come into Fountain Church 
And there's a big Nigerian contingent. There's a big Zimbabwean contingent. There are many Kenyans. There are many English. There are Americans. What if I come from Papua New Guinea? And when the Zimbabweans invite themselves to their things, and the Nigerians invite themselves, and the Kenyans, and the English, who's going to invite me? And do you know that in these places where we fellowship, it is where we come to know one another and speak life into people. God does not like cliques. Let me put it to you. Not during the time of revival. Because you are first a child of God before you are Jamaican. You are first a child of God before you are English. You are a child of God. You are called by his name. You are washed by his blood. And when you see your fellow brother in Christ, you should see more similarity in them than you see even in some of your biological people. You know, someone came and said to Jesus, your mother and your brothers, are, he said, who's my mother? You know some things Jesus said, if you are one to be offended, you will take offense. You will really receive offense and, and, and you will quit coming around there. He said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He says, these ones, they are my brothers, my mothers, my fathers, my sisters. This is who we are. You ask me, who is my mother? Who? I say, these, I have mothers here. And this is why I can see trainer Bob and trainer Benedette. I haven't seen you for a long time. Last time I was in the woods, I saw you. But I can come to you and we just carry on from there. I don't need to reintroduce myself. If they need help and I know it, it is not about the last time I saw them. Because that's my mother. That's my father. These are my sisters and my brothers. Some are my children. This is my family. And these people, they realize this. And because they realize this, they began to build on a foundation of love. Hallelujah. Love is, is everything. It is everything, I'm telling you. Do you know that when these 3,000 were added to their number and they began to sit together, that there was a, what's the word that they use in economics? You know when, 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 when costs come together? What's the word? Where, where are the economists here? Yes, economies of scale. You know when you bring things together and you share resources, things are more? When these people came together, there was economies of scale when it comes to knowledge. These people, some of them, they'd come from the corners of Turkey, others from the Far East. And they were all from different places and they began to share their experiences. What they had in common was God. And they began to share their cuisines. They began to say, wow, let me see what you guys eat. The Bible says that they sold their property and possessions, shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. I would have loved to be part of that church. Even the sharing of meals and opening of our homes, it is part of the foundation of love for the end time revival. Hallelujah. There is a call to be responsible not only for our well-being, but that of everyone. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money. You see, sometimes we want revival, but are we ready to pay the cost for revival? Are you ready to pay? First, do you know what revival is? Or is it an abstract con uh, concept that you haven't? When revival hits my brother, my sister, the greatest benefactor is you. When revival hits and you're in the midst of revival, when you speak to people who've been in the midst of revival, everything else loses value. 
money loses value. Certain jobs lose value. Your Gucci handbag, your Hermes handbag loses its value. You are able to take your Hermes handbag and give it to a sister who has nothing. You are able to take off your Rolex and give it to someone who's never put a watch on. When you are in the middle of revival, my friend, you are able to see people in such a valuable way that you cannot even compare to your possessions. And that's what was happening. They sold their property. These people are not alien to us. My people, they loved their houses too. You don't love your house more than they love theirs. You don't love your jewelry more than they love theirs. But when revival hit, there was a transformation in the way that they understood what is important and what isn't. And did they sell their property for nothing? It was because they saw that there were others who were in need. And they said that since we are in this together, we will share everything together. Hallelujah. Revival and love calls for a responsibility for each other's well-being, not just our own. I should care about your children, not just my own. When winter hits, I should care about my heat, your heating, not just my own. And it is through the fellowship that you come to know that somebody is not heating their home. It is through fellowship that you come to know that somebody is not feeding their, their children as they are supposed to. There is a call to regular fellowship and intentional in opening our homes to one another. He says, they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. There is something special about inviting someone to your home. And Fountain Church, hear me out and take this very seriously. Because this is, the Lord has given me this word for you. You need to open your home to people. Hear me very, if, 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 if I had said nothing else today but this, the Lord is saying you need to open your home for fellowship for the believers. You haven't had someone in your home this whole year. And there are reasons I understand. We are busy. Sometimes we feel that our homes are not adequate enough to welcome people. You are waiting until you change your sofa or you change your carpets. God is saying, don't worry about that. That is not of importance. Revival is depending on your obedience in this area. Revival is dependent on your obedience in this area. I understand not everybody in a is in a position to open their homes. And so those of you who are receive this message. There is there are boundaries that are broken in the fellowship when people come together in homes and break bread. And when these boundaries are not broken, the enemy works to create war and strife. Do you know one of the reasons why Africa is such a war-ravaged continent? Is because some people sat down about a century ago and decided to draw boundaries through communities. Do you know that? Which country in Europe have you seen with a straight line of a border? You go and look at Kenya. It's literally a ruler ch 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 with very sharp angles. Look at Angola. Sudan is just literally straight lines. Someone thought it's a good idea and they had their reasons, to draw a line between communities 
In Kenya, they drew a line between the Maasai community, separating families. They drew lines between places of high-value mineral wealth. And until today, the continent where I come from is war-ravaged because of boundaries, man-made boundaries. The enemy is drawing boundaries in the fellowship of the believers. That's what he wants. He wants to draw boundaries. He wants everybody to have somebody they don't get on with in the church. He wants you to go around looking for offense in the church. And God is saying that I am we I'm ready to break these things and these boundaries, but I'm asking you to open your homes. Come together and break bread. Come together and eat. Don't spiritualize it. Just come and share meals. And they did that. And they were intentional about it. And they did it with great joy and great generosity. It's a challenge that I cannot stress enough. Because God has said to me that there is revival coming. We all know it. He's, he's, we have seen it. But he is now saying there are certain things I want you to do. If I've blessed you with a home, invite somebody. Hallelujah. And he finishes by saying, the joy of goodwill, all while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. There is joy in goodwill. We begin to realize the goodwill in people. And when we are available to cultivate love, God will cause there to be growth. Let me say that again. I've just seen the time, so I need, I need to conclude. When we are available to cultivate love, God will cause there to be growth. Okay, I need you to say it with me. Your amen, may you hear me? When I am available to cultivate love, God will cause there to be growth. Each day, the Bible says, the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. Each day, there was growth. Something I've shared with someone this week. If you look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 5, the Bible says, The Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Neither wild plants nor grain were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not yet sent rain to water the earth. Why? Because there was no people to cultivate the soil. God made everything, but he stopped short of making plants and vegetation before he made man. He made everything, but then he stopped and made man before making plants and vegetation. Because if he had made it, there was nobody to cultivate the soil. And so what did he do? He stopped the rain. The Bible says that there was no rain. He didn't send rain water on the earth. If you don't learn to be obedient and diligent in management of what God has given you, there will be no growth. There cannot be growth where there is no management. In any area of your life, when you're not managing your time or your resources in the way God wants you to manage them, there cannot be growth. God said there was no rain because there was no man to cultivate the soil. God wants us to cultivate love in the church. And it's when we cultivate love that he will bring growth. And the reason why people are being added to these people every day is because they were cultivating the soil called love. There was management. They managed everything that they had in order for them to foster love. How well can you get to know each other if you just speak at church? If you just meet here at church, how well will you actually get to, who's going to tell you 
really what they are going through and really what they need prayer with. If all you do is speak over there for five minutes after the end of the service. And how would the world know that you love each other? Because the world is not in here. But the world is on your streets. For some of you, the world is your husband. For some of you, the world is your children. And if they see the people of God loving one another, the Bible says they will know the God who has sent them. Hallelujah. How can our love for each other increase if we don't give our time to each other? Sharing a laugh. Sharing good food. Connected girls. Those of you who came to my house, did we not have a good time? No? Alison shook her head. I won't invite you again. But it was good, wasn't it? We, we, you broke barriers. Some of you used to look at me and, and, and pass away and think we can't speak to him. We are all human beings and we can all share a laugh. We can all share food. We broke pizza <laughs> on that day. And so God is saying, share your time with somebody. Hallelujah. Let me finish on this and say that, you see, there are rights and there are responsibilities. We have rights. It is your right not to invite people to your home. It is your right. It is your right to spend all your spare time just with your family or by yourself. It is your right to have your house clean or to have the things that you think you need before you invite people. It is your right to keep people away. But what is your responsibility? Your responsibility is to show hospitality and love, especially those within the church. Your responsibility is to share what God has given you, your home, your food, your laughter, your joy, your stories, your experiences. It is your responsibility to open yourself up to others, to share what God is teaching you. It is your responsibility. Yes, it may be your right not to do it. I'm talking about rights versus responsibilities. Hallelujah. I want to make an altar call. But the altar call I'm making today is not one where I will ask you to come to the altar. The call that I want to make to you today is at the end of this service to find somebody who you don't speak too much. And let me say this is for, you know, Fountain Church, and, but if you, if, if you are a guest and you want to, that's fine. But for the people of the house, can I make a call to you in response to this message? It doesn't matter if you've been here for three weeks or 10 years. Let me explain something to you. When these 3,000 people were added to them, they were welcomed into this fellowship. And some, sometimes we, we want to only interact with people that we feel that we have known for time. But if someone is professing Christ, put your inhibitions aside. Let us begin to cultivate the soil of love. My call to you today, don't even be awkward about it. You may even feel awkward. Just go and say, I want to welcome you to my home. And exchange details and make a plan. And I'm asking that you don't do it to the people that come to your home. Go to the furthest person or someone who you don't interact with and just say, brother, sister, I want to welcome you to my home. And single young men and single young ladies, don't use this excuse. <laughs> we are responding to the word of God. It's not your, <laughs> your license. <laughs> to invite people to your home, but you get what I mean. Let us respond and begin to cultivate love.
Hi everybody, we just want to welcome you to our different activities which happen here in Fountain Church. On Monday we have our men's fellowship which happen here at 6.30. On Tuesday we've got the intercession which also happen here at 6.30. Wednesday Bible study we meet online on Zoom and on Friday we have the young people connected meeting at 6.30 and the women in power at 7 and inspire all the young people in this church. Uh, they meet every two weeks so we can't wait to see you there. God bless you and you have a lovely day.